Middle school, how we doing? Doing good? Hey, I want let to let you in on a little secret. Middle schoolers are the coolest people on planet Earth. Do you agree? No, I knew that. That's easy, right? It's awesome to be hanging out at middle schoolers tonight. Uh, some of you might know this, actually. I'm actually currently, some of you are going to be like, oh, a middle school teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Hayden knows. Hayden is a past student of mine, actually. I teach soul studies, best class, easily, easily. Hayden saying no right up here front. Thanks, Hayden. I've actually been teaching middle school for about 10 years now. And needless to say, for good or bad, I'm pretty used to middle schoolers. And I'm like knee deep in middle school culture. I hear the word Fortnite literally every day. I've seen every, uh, not seen everyone, but I've seen all the various TikTok dances, you know, the dab, that's pretty old, the floss, the gritty, literally every day. If there's been a TikTok trend in the last two years, I guarantee I've seen it. And I've even picked up some of that, you know, cutting edge middle school lingo. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know when kids use those words that are like just a made up language, like they're just pulling stuff from nowhere? Bruh, Mr. Lee's class is pretty bussin', no cap. You know, with the hood up, pants way up here, good times. I've seen fads come and go during my time as a teacher, but you know that some of your youth leaders in here, we had our own lingo back in the day too. Do you know that? Before we start up today, I'm going to literally turn the tables on you guys. For once in my life, I can make you feel uncomfortable about not knowing the words. So I'm always trying to figure out the new middle school lingo. So I'm going to give you guys a chance. I'm going to give you guys a chance. Okay, I got three words for you. If you can tell me what this word means, I will give you a sucker that I've had since Halloween. Get that out of the house. Here's the first word. I got an assortment of flavors up here. Bodacious. Does anyone know? You can't answer, Josie. What's bodacious mean? What's your name? What's bodacious mean? Logan, does this mean cool? <sighs> cool? Man, I don't know if I can take cool. What's your name? Yep. Macy, what do you think bodacious means? Weird? Eh, not weird. Let me, maybe it's better if I use it in a sentence. And this is from the 80s, so I got to put a little accent on it, okay? Dude, that wave was like bodacious, man. Bodacious. Thor. It was crazy. It was excellent. Uh, Thor, I got a question for you. Grape, uh, orange, orange again, or cherry? Grape. Nice job. There you go. Have fun. It's probably expired. <clears throat> okay. That being said, next word. So bodacious, excellent, awesome, wonderful. Tubular. Tubular man. What do you think tubular means? Radical? Sure, I'll give it to you. What, uh, what cherry or orange? Uh, cherry. Oh, good choice. Again, like I said, Halloween. Again, like I said, Halloween. Sorry about that. Final word, kind of interesting here. So tubular means like the most perfect thing. So close enough. Radical. Radical. Yes, sir. What's radical mean? Awesome and cool. Ugh, I need a little bit, a little bit more there. Dope. Dope. <laughs> As a 90s kid, wow, that's dope. What do you think? What do you think it means? Crazy? One more. How about you in the back? Gnarly? I like gnarly. I like gnarly, but I think I like dope a little bit more, okay? Orange or cherry? Cherry. No orange? No love for orange? Here you go, Jared. Take an orange. Okay. Josie, you like oranges? Here you go. Okay. Hey, listen. Uh, so you probably knew a couple of those words, right? I mean, maybe you've, I think, I mean, it's interesting because you actually said radical. And tonight we're going to, we're going to zone in on that word. Radical. See, back in the 80s when you said something was radical, it kind of means that it was really extreme, right? 
And why are we talking about the word radical tonight? Like, why, why, is, that, why is that the focus for tonight? Because as we're going to see in our text from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ is radical. And yeah, he's cool. And yeah, he's, he's gnarly, right? But radical, actually, when it's not a slang term, you can say it this way. Radical means very different from the usual or favoring extreme changes. If I say someone is radical about something, I'm saying that they're doing something very, very extreme. They're doing something that most other people do not do. Okay. They're shaking things up. Does that sound like Jesus? Yeah. Did he shake things up? You bet he did. Was he extreme on some things? Yeah, he was. But if we're being honest tonight, we usually prefer to describe Jesus with other words, right? Jesus, the Lord of heaven is loving. Jesus is kind. Jesus is merciful. Jesus is accepting. Now, are all those true? Amen. They absolutely are. Jesus is all those things, but guys, Jesus is also radical. And you know what? He's calling you, if you're his follower, to be radical too. How do I know? Well, because if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and join me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, as we dive in again to the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to be reading down to verse 30. So what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching on an actual mount. He's most likely teaching to Jews. People who would already know all of God's rules from the Old Testament. Rules we know. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit murder. Thou shall not commit adultery. Same things we learn here in church. And what does he say about those rules? He says that they have a purpose. And he actually says that he's come to fulfill those rules pretty good so far. Not really super radical, not really mixing things up. He's agreeing with what most people would say about religion. But then in our passage today, Jesus gets radical. Here we go. Verse 21, Matthew 5. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, if you're even being angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. What? If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, that is, if you say something mean to someone or about someone, you are in danger. Now watch this. If you curse someone, you are in danger, don't miss this, of the fires of hell. Ouch. Guys, this is radical. This is way different. This is extreme. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? You see, we can all agree that murder's bad, right? I mean, murder's bad, right? Okay. <laughs> Hopefully you all agree with that, right? We all know that. If someone commits murder in the United States, our country, by law, you normally have to serve at least... 30 years in jail, if not a life sentence. We take this pretty seriously. But what does Jesus say? He says that being angry with someone, calling someone an idiot, cursing someone, that makes you guilty too. What? Have you ever called anyone an idiot? Your siblings? Your friends? Your parents? Maybe not to their face. I have countless times. What does Jesus say? I'm in danger, not just of a little, hey, do better next time. I'm in danger. What does he say? The fires of hell. The Lord Jesus Christ is loving. He's kind, but he's also radical. Radical. He is extreme. See, we don't like to think about hell very often. We, we don't. We especially don't like to think about going there. But guys, I want you to realize something tonight. This is very, very important. Do you know which person in the Bible talks about hell more than anyone else? 
not Moses, not the prophets, Jesus. Jesus talks more about hell than anyone else in the Bible. Doesn't stop there either. If you have a Bible, skip down to verse 27. Here's what it says. You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. That is intimate relationships outside of marriage. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman, or in a girl's case, vice versa, at a man, with lust has already committed adultery with him or her in their hearts. Again, we see Jesus' radical call. That's radical. Just looking at another boy or girl is the same in Jesus' mind as actually committing adultery. Now, I realize you guys are still young, but take heed of what the Lord is saying here, of what Jesus is saying here. Those intrusive thoughts about the boys and girls around you. We're in middle school. When you give into those thoughts, when you embrace them, when you act on them, even in your mind, what happens from the perspective of Jesus? You're in sin and you deserve judgment. Now, again, we're not talking about temptation here. We're talking about when you act on that thought, when you, you think about it, you dwell on it, you actually do something with it, whatever that may be. So what's the first way that Jesus is radical? Here it is. Well, first of all, he calls all of us, me included, to have a radical view of our sin, an extreme view of our sin. Did anyone see a pattern when we were going through those verses? Anyone notice what Jesus said every single time, uh, whenever? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, good. I love that. Great observation. What does he actually say though? He says, you have what? You've heard this, but I say this. You've heard this, but I say this. What is going on here? What is, G what is, what is Jesus referring to? Well, to find that out, we actually, we have to go back a couple verses. Okay. If you have a Bible, this isn't, this isn't our passage, but I think it's important to go here. If you're in your Bible, just look up at verse 20. Look at verse 20. And here's what verse 20 says. Jesus talking again. I warn you, unless your righteousness, your goodness, is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Who are the Pharisees? Who, who are the Pharisees? I mean, come on. We've been in, you know, civil kids. Some of us know the, the Pharisees are. Go ahead, buddy. Oh. So when Jesus came around with his radical ideas, dude, you just want to come up here and preach with me, man? That's awesome. <laughs> nice job, buddy. That's awesome. Very good. The Pharisees were the most religious people of Jesus' day. The Pharisees were the personification of what it looks like to be a good person right? They're actually, when Jesus says, uh, you need to be good, you need to be righteous, his audience, the Jews, they probably thought of these guys. Walk around in their robes. The Pharisees looked on the outside to be the most religious people of all time. They had, if you have a Bible with you, the Old and the New Testament. Some Pharisees had the Old Testament memorized. I got like a couple of verses memorized, they had the Old Testament memorized. That's amazing. They prayed all the time. They actually taught the scriptures. If these guys were around today, they'd be like super Christians, right? Be like the pastors. They'd probably have the whole Bible memorized. They'd only eat at Chick-fil-A, right? They would have all the latest worship songs memorized. They'd be absolutely dope at Nine Square. I mean, these guys are the church people. They were seen as the ultimate expression of religion and goodness in Jesus' day. And what does the Lord Jesus say? He says, in order to go to heaven, 
you have to be more righteous than those guys. In order to live with God forever, you have to be more righteous than the most righteous people at the time. It seems impossible, right? As some of you may know, Rachel and I just had a baby. Praise the Lord. But here's the deal. When you have a baby, you get a lot of stuff, okay? We have diapers galore. We got play sets. We got clothes for every hour of every day. And shocker, with all of our newfound stuff, we kind of run out of room in our apartment. This is a picture of our actual uh, closet. Rachel, it's sure is good Rachel's not here. She would hate if I showed you guys this, okay? I got all this stuff in here. You see that? It's just diapers, just diapers all day, right? Just keep on going up there all the way to heaven. It can be a little rough, but you know what's awesome about having a kid? Besides the fact that she's really cute, you get to have a meal train. Anyone know what a meal train is? What's a meal train? Dude, awesome. Just, just guys, this is a sweet gig, okay? Not only do we have delicious food, but we get to hang out with a bunch of our friends. Jared and Alyssa came over, which that food was amazing, by the way. It was incredible. And we just played marbles. It's great. Fellowship and feasting sold. It's been awesome. But if people are coming over all the time, you know what that means, right? We got to clean the house. Oof. Who in here has ever been asked to clean their room? <laughs> yeah, literally almost everybody, right? Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you should clean your room, okay? <laughs> now, who in here has ever cleaned their room, but they didn't do a very good job at it? Yeah, you know who you are. You probably clean your room the way that Rachel and I cleaned our apartment before Jared and Alyssa came over. The old push and shove strategy. Who's ever done that before? You know what this is, right? You basically just pick up all the clutter and just throw it in the closet, right? You know, slap a little water on the tables, do a quick vacuum, and boom, the room's clean. So I do this. Some of you have probably done this. If you would allow me for just a minute, I want you to think in your head, of a, just a really quick scenario, okay? About cleaning your room. Okay, close your eyes if you have to, okay? Here's what it is. Imagine with me that you are having a guest over for dinner tomorrow night and your house is a mess. I mean, there's junk everywhere. Like a tornado went through. Now, knowing your house is a mess, you do the classic push and shove strategy, right? Oh, hello. Whoa, that had some power behind it, Okay. And you quickly get the house in order. There's junk piled all over the, the, all over the place. So you, you put it in the closet. You put it in the cupboards. You put some underneath your bed. So now your house on the outside looks really clean. I mean, someone walks in. They're like, wow, these guys are tidy. But then your guest arrives. And who is your guest? Jesus Christ. The Son of God the Messiah, the Lord of Lords. Now, obviously you're a bit nervous because God is visiting, but Jesus walks in your home. He hugs you. He brought over some nice bread with him. He throw that in the oven. And before you know it, he makes a beeline to your closet. He opens it up. All your junk falls on the floor and you're just, uh, uh, but it's not over. Jesus walks over your cupboards. He opens those up. All your junk falls out. He walks over to your dresser. More junk falls out. He looks underneath your bed, just pulls all the junk out. He he continues to do this for 30 minutes until all your junk is just all over the house. And then you finally realize something about Jesus. You can't hide your junk from Jesus. Why does Jesus give us these radical statements calling hate murder and lustful thoughts adultery? Because the Pharisees, like our clean apartments or, or my clean house, they look good on the, in the, on the outside. They did and said all the right things. They were religious, but in the inside, they were full of junk, full of death. 
Jesus said this about the Pharisees in chapter three. Check it out. Here's what it says. This is a strong word. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you are like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but you're filled inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Jesus is warning his audience, warning me and you, that he requires internal obedience. He requires internal goodness, not just outward religious devotion. You see, we humans, we only see what people see on the outside, but God can see what's in your heart. Now, most likely you've never murdered anyone, hopefully, but have you hated anyone? Maybe you've never committed adultery, but have you given in to some kind of lustful thought? Jesus says that even these deserve judgment. And what kind of judgment? The fires of hell. Guys, listen, that's radical. And it's a little scary. My question for you tonight is this, and I, do not leave this room until you think about this. Seriously, think about this. I had to think about this in my life, and so did your youth leaders. What does your room look like when Jesus comes knocking? Or you could say, what does your heart look like? And how do you know if your heart is clean? How do you know if your room is clean enough for God? Well, what are you trusting in for your salvation? Are you trusting in Christ's sacrifice on the cross? And his resurrection? Or are you trusting in things you do? The things you say? The friends you know? Your family? Are you hiding anything from God right now? Things you've just pushed into the closet of your heart so people can't see it? Guys, I've done that. But listen, God can see your heart. There's no hiding our junk from him. That's a hard word. So what do we do? What do we do? How are we called to fight this? Jesus gives us the answer. Here's what he says. This is verse 24. You got to go up a little bit now. If you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, so you're worshiping God and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you or you have something against someone else, leave your sacrifice there at the altar and be reconciled to that person. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that we need to actually, to the people that we call an idiot, the people that we've been mean to, we're actually called as Christians to go make things right to them, to apologize to them. Who in here has ever apologized to someone you didn't want to? That's good. Who in here has ever apologized to someone that you've talked bad about their, behind them, behind their back, and they didn't know? Maybe you've done that. It's great if you have, but that's hard. That's hard. And why is that hard? Because it's really embarrassing because you look like a fool and you look mean, right? But Jesus says this, guys, if you have beef with someone, if you've wronged someone, if you called someone names, you got to go apologize that person before you come and worship God. See, we can come to youth group and sing the songs and play the games. It's good stuff. But Jesus is saying, If you are, if you're just, if you come here and you do all the religious stuff, but you're a jerk to people outside these walls, don't come and worship me until you've been reconciled with that person. That's radical. Jesus looks at our inner heart, not our outer actions, but he takes even further. Check out verse 29. Here's what it says. This very famous verse. If your eye, even your good eye causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now listen, does Jesus want us to literally cut off our hands and pluck out our eyes? There'd be a lot of ugly people in this room if that was the case, right? I would have no arms and both my eyes would be gone. Okay, so this isn't literal. What's he saying? He's saying that we need to get rid of the things that are causing us to struggle. So how is Jesus radical? Number two, 
He doesn't just call us to see our sin radically. He wants us to repent. And that's radical. What is repentance? Who can tell me? If I say repent, what does that mean? Go ahead. Confessing is part of repentance, but there's another part. Go ahead. Good. Say you're sorry. Confess to God. Go ahead. Very good. Repentance doesn't just mean necessarily confess. It means you actually have to turn. You have to change of the, the trajectory. You have to change things. The things we're trying to hide away from Jesus, we got to actually bring those to light and then change it, right? So the idea is with repentance, it means to change your mind. Going back to the clean your room analogy. Okay, you, listen, you can clean your room all you want, push and shove and switch. The best way sometimes to clean our room is just to throw that stuff away, okay? Some of us just have stuff in our heart we just gotta get rid of. That's the picture that Jesus is painting. So let me ask you, and I really want you to think about this. Is there anything in your life that is worth more than knowing God? You could even say, is there anything in my life that's not worth giving up for God? (laughs) That's a big question in middle school. But you got to consider that if we're actually a follower. Jesus said, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way, turn the other way, take up your cross and follow me. Guys, listen, being a Christian, you got to hear this, is not meant to be comfortable. Being a Christian is a call to death. It's a call to cut away the things that cause us to lose sight of God. Could be video games. You're talking to a former video game addict right here. It could be your friend group. Maybe some friends in your life are just, they're just not good and you know it. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's your phone. You fill in the blank. What is in your life that you need to cut out? Because I promise you, and I guarantee your youth group leaders would say the same. Jesus is worth it. He loves you on a level and satisfies you on a level that none of those things will ever satisfy you. The apostle Paul put it this way. I love this verse. This is Paul talking. Everything else is worthless when I compare it to the infinite value of knowing Jesus. For his sake, I discarded everything else, counted it as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Jesus is calling you guys to have a radical view of your sin. He's calling you to have radical repentance, turn the other way, but that's not all. You know what, guys? Radical repentance is hard. Does it sound hard? It does to me. Radical repentance is hard. Maybe you're here tonight and you're like, Colton, this sounds all good and everything, but I don't think I can do it. I'm not strong enough. I like that stuff too much. If that's you tonight, I re- you got to hear this, okay? You are right where you need to be. When you say, I can't do it, you are right where you want to be. Jesus calls us to a radical view of sin, a radical view of repentance, but he also calls us to radical salvation. Listen, you remember when Jesus said about righteousness in verse 20 about the Pharisees? Okay, check this out. The reason the Pharisees are not righteous enough for God is because they think that they have it all figured out. But if you go a little further up in Matthew 5, this is what Jesus says. I love this verse. God blesses those who are poor and they realize their need for him. Are you sitting right here and you're like, dude, I can't live like that. I like this stuff too much. Jesus just doesn't seem good enough. Tell that to God. Say, Jesus, I want to love you, but I can't. I I just, I, I like my stuff too much. And he'll bless that. Why does God call us to a radical view of of our sin to admit that we're more sinful than we actually appear? Because the only way to be righteous before a perfect God is to confess that you can never be righteous. To trust in what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus, guys, took your place on the cross. 
He paid the debt that you owe, and then he rose again. Listen, Christianity is not about how well you know the rules or follow them. Christianity is about how well you know Jesus and follow him. So the question is, is this, have you accepted this radical salvation? Christianity is not about who your parents are. It's not about who your friends are, what church you go to, what things you do, what things you don't do. Christianity is all about Jesus. It's a call to a personal relationship with your maker. And he loves you so much that he came into this world and died to purchase you. You see, many people today think they have to push and shove their junk away in order for them to accept Jesus. But the beauty of the gospel is this. If you're willing to accept that your life is a mess, if you're standing in that room and the junk's just everywhere and the junk's your sin, you just have all this stuff. You're like, man, I just, I know I'm messed up. And Jesus is standing there and you admit to Jesus. You say, here I am, Jesus. I'm a mess. I can't possibly clean up my heart on my own. I'm sorry. Please help me. You know what Jesus does in that moment? He looks at you in your mess. Whatever sin you might be struggling with, he grabs you. He gives you a big old hug and he says, your sins are forgiven. Now follow me. Then he bends down and he starts picking up your room with you. Jesus Christ is radical. He calls you to be radical. Are you experiencing this radical faith? We hope you are. And if you're not, talk to us. Jesus lives to clean up our mess. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, even this, even this guy, I'm a mess. But Lord Jesus, you come and clean up our mess. So Father, I pray that you would just start cleaning right now, God. Holy Spirit, come into this room. Maybe there's some kids in this room right now, Lord, that they would admit, yeah, I don't, I don't live like that. But I want to. God, may they just call out to you now. Lord Jesus, may they call out to you. God, you say you will bless those who know that they need you. And Lord, may they realize, God, that you accept them in their mess and that you've forgiven them through the cross. And Lord, I pray for those in this room that already know you. Help us be radical in our faith. Help us be willing to let go of the things that separate us from you because Jesus, you are better. It's in your name we pray, amen.